Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian. My name is Greg, and it's April 11th. It's a beautiful day outside. Um, I've been spending way too much time indoors, obviously. We're still living under the uh, social or proximal distancing guidelines set forth by the government, but they are encouraging people to get outdoors uh, when you can do it safely, so I thought it'd be great to move outside to take a look at another watch. This is another Casio, and it's appropriate that we're doing this outdoors because this watch is a little bit different um, than what I would usually take a look at. Um, this is one of Casio's twin sensor models. It's not a fancy watch like a Pro Trek. Um, this is just out of their normal sport line. This is actually the SGW-100. And it's a watch that I really came by purely by happenstance. Um, ever since the early 90s when Casio and Citizen and a couple of other companies started playing around with um, incorporating technology into their watches that wasn't related directly to timekeeping, I have been supremely disinterested in that technology. And I have been disinterested in that because usually it seems like a waste. I think of a watch as a timekeeping device. Anything else that it can do, while it might be useful, generally tends to waste energy. Um, and in the past, it was usually quite unreliable. Um, a lot of these watches had pressure sensors built into them. They had these huge protuberances off the side of the case. You can see that's not the case with this watch. Um, but I came by this watch accidentally. I bought out a bunch of watches from a Walmart jewelry department that was uh, being phased out. I got a quite a few watches at clearance prices. I may have mentioned in previous videos, I do have a small eBay concern where I buy watches if I can find them at a, you know, at a discount price and then resell them at a very modest profit and uh, make a little bit of extra money on the side there. So I had no intention of this being my watch. I'd just like to apologize right now for all the jump cuts uh, that are going to be in this video. The wind keeps picking up and I'm trying to minimize the amount of wind noise in the microphones. Um, I have my shotgun microphone with me, but I forgot the, the little fuzzy sock that goes over the outside of it. So I'm just using the regular internal mics in the camera. And I'm keeping talking right now so that you can hear that there is some wind noise because the wind is blowing right at the moment. So while I've generally not been particularly interested in watches that have extra sensors built into them, um, I was doing a little bit of research about this particular watch prior to putting it up for sale. And I, this one has a compass, one of the two sensors. It's got a, um, it has a thermometer, a digital thermometer built into it. And it also has a digital compass built into it. And that's really what I want to look at today. Uh, because when I was researching this watch prior to putting it up for sale, I read quite a few uh, customer reviews uh, of the watch. And there were numerous... Um, comments made by people who were disappointed with the watch in general. Um, they were disappointed with the fact that the compass inside it doesn't work like the compass in their smartphone. And I also read uh, some reviews where people were talking about how inaccurate the compass is, that it was off by as much as 10 to 20 degrees. And if you understand how digital compasses work, I did a little bit, but I've done some more research now. Uh, it seemed very unlikely to me that uh, unless Casio had made a huge engineering blunder in designing their, uh, their compass module, which is built into this watch, it seemed almost impossible um, that the, the compass could be as inaccurate as uh, plus or minus 10 or 20 degrees. That would be totally unacceptable. And so what I'm hoping to demonstrate today is that this compass is in fact quite accurate if you use it correctly. Um, where some of the misconceptions have come about this watch and how to go about using it correctly. So I wanted to do that outdoors uh, and I'm going to try to do that before the wind whips up again. But uh, if the wind persists as it has been, we might move indoors to actually do this. So let's go do it. All right, guys, so I've been able to determine using the electronic compass inside my iPhone here 
uh, the direction of due south and due north. So I've put this piece of tape on here uh, longitudinally aligned with north and south. I do have my phone, by the way, set to uh, magnetic, uh, to indicate magnetic north as opposed to true north. And as we all know, these work extremely well. They're very hard to um, confuse. Uh, and you can see when we line that up, it's just about there again. All right, so then we should be able to, assuming that this is working correctly, we should be able to find the same north-south longitudinal line using the electronic compass inside this watch. Uh, now these are basically the same, uh, they work on the same principle. The compass inside the iPhone um, works pretty much on a real-time basis. As you turn it, it's working. You could actually use this for navigating. It's very um, very accurate and uh, very dynamic. Now it does chew up a lot of power and it's attached to a much larger device than a wristwatch and uh, you can charge it up when the battery gets dead at the end of the day so you're not so worried about power consumption. And it's hard to fool this compass simply by tilting it. And there's a reason for that. Um, these, both of these compasses use uh, small devices, modules, which are called magnetometers. And most magnetometers, and I believe the magnetometer in here and the magnetometer in here, are both using a phenomenon called the Hall effect. That's H-A-L-L. -L. So the Hall effect says that if you run a current through a conductor of a known voltage and you introduce a magnetic field to that conductor, the voltage will change. And you can measure the voltage change and you can determine um, the, the strength of the magnetic field and several other things. I'm not a physicist, but... So it stands to reason if you build a circuit with conductors running in different directions um, and then introduce a magnetic field, you can actually figure out the orientation of that magnetic field. Now the magnetometer inside this wristwatch only has two axes, east, west, north, south. So it has an X and a Y uh, axis. The magnetometer inside the iPhone has three axes. It's got an X, a Y, and a Z axis. So it's much harder to fool it by tilting it or whatever. So we know that this works very well. And this is, when people hear electronic compass, this is what they expect. A lot of younger people, um, people who aren't familiar with older technology, are going to expect to get something like this and say, oh, I can just wear it on my wrist and run around the woods and navigate and all of that. But this is quite a bit different, although it is using the Hall effect and it's basically the same sort of mechanism. But as I've said, the magnetometer in this uh, watch only has two axes, an X and a Y. And as a result of that, one of the first problems I think a lot of people are running into is they try to take a measurement while it's still on their wrist. And this is not going to work very well when it's tilted at a, whatever this is, 30 degree angle or something. In order to take an accurate reading with this compass, it's got to be as flat as humanly possible. Now I have a table right here, which is essentially level, so it's very easy to get it flat here. If I'm out in the woods, for instance, you might ask, how on earth am I going to get the compass flat? Well, there is a trick that I've used, and that's to take the watch off and to let the straps dangle down and simply, simply balance the watch on the tip of your finger until you can feel that it's not tilting at all, and then take your reading. And that's actually going to be fairly level. It should be level enough. But we don't need to do that. We've got this lovely tabletop here, so we're going to use this as our level surface. So that's one problem. A lot of people 
use this watch expecting you to be able to navigate with it and hold it at all kinds of weird angles and it'll tell you which direction is which. And it just doesn't work that way. This is actually, now, Casio is manufacturing watches, I think, in their, um, their uh, what is it, the Protrek series, which are much more expensive. This is older technology. This has a, uh, I think, a third generation magnetometer in it. I think what the Protrex are using nowadays is like a fourth or fifth generation magnetometer. But to Casio's credit, instead of um, just throwing away old technology, uh, this has a very small module. It's only like the size of the head of a pin. It's pretty amazing on its own. But rather than just chucking that away when they came out with a new series of Protrek with a more sophisticated compass, they simply moved the module that's in this watch downscale made it a little bit cheaper. They put it in a watch that only costs about $65, and if you use it properly, it's still going to give you very accurate readings. Um, there's another thing that you need to know about this watch, or the compass in this watch. When you use it, it needs to be calibrated, and it should be calibrated on a fairly regular basis. So, um, and that's not a very difficult or daunting process, you simply need to know how to do it. So in order to calibrate the compass, it really needs to be off your wrist because this is a dynamic calibration. You're going to have to slowly turn the watch around while trying to keep it fairly level as the calibration is taking place. So the orange button here on the side is your compass and temperature button. That activates both of the internal sensors here. And so we press that, and that's going to put us in compass mode. Now, the adjust button up here, which we would usually use to set the time, you hold that in for about two seconds. Calibration comes up. Now you press the compass button again. And see how there's an arrow that's slowly moving around the dial? I'm not really keeping up with it, am I? Oh, shit, I can't see it through the camera. We're just going to keep turning that and turning that and turning that for two full revolutions, trying to keep the blinking arrow away from us. Two full revolutions. It's still going around, still going around. And now we hit this button and it's calibrated. So now let's see just how accurate the thing is. We'll go back into the normal mode. We'll get, and this is really meant for taking static readings. So we've got the, 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 the watch off of our wrist. And you can do this while it's on the wrist if you're careful about getting it as flat as possible. And now we take a compass reading. This is aligned with our um, piece of tape. So this should be due north. That should be due south. So when I take this reading, the reading should be fairly close to 180 degrees. And look at that, 179 degrees. So you can clearly see this is not off by 10 degrees or 20 degrees. Let's try it again. That's about as close to perfect as you can possibly get. And this is a much less sophisticated magnetometer module than that found in this uh, admittedly fairly old style iPhone, but it can do just as accurate a job if you use it as it was intended. You gotta calibrate it, you gotta try to keep it flat, and another complaint from people is the fact that when you take a reading and you start moving it around, it will sort of stabilize for a little while. It doesn't respond very quickly, and you can't really use it for navigation because it only continues to take readings for, what was that, about 5, 10 seconds? And then it goes back into sort of a sleep mode. There's a reason for that. As I alluded to earlier, um, when the battery on your iPhone dies, you can plug it in and charge it back up. You have to do that pretty much once a day anyhow. The uh, energy demands or the energy supply inside a watch battery, which is very, very, very tiny and has a very small amount of potential energy in, or stored energy inside of it, um, 
needs to last for two, three, four years. People don't want to be changing the battery. There's no capacity for recharging a watch like this. Why they didn't make it solar, I have no idea. Then it could recharge itself every time it was out in the sun, but they didn't. It's just a battery powered thing and there's a very tiny amount of energy in there which has to be metered out over a long period of time. And so the power demands for running the Compass module inside a watch like this are much greater than the normal timekeeping function. And the energy supply in the battery is, has to be very, very carefully uh, regulated. And so this thing can't just constantly run all the time. You've got to take a reading, maybe uh, find a landmark, walk to that landmark, take another reading, just as you would using a, uh, a compass for land navigation. Uh, but used correctly, this can be a really helpful tool outdoors. Um, other than that, it's a little bit more bright and cheerful than a G-Shock. It does feature a, a mineral glass crystal. It does feature 200 meters of water resistance. So it's a pretty tough, serious field watch. Um, but again, it's a little bit more brightly colored. You've got this blue case. You've got some orange and silver accents on the anodized aluminum bezel ring. You've got this bright orange button for the compass feature. So it doesn't look as militaristic as most G-Shocks do. I know G-Shocks come in a rainbow of colors nowadays, but most of them are pretty drab. Most of the standards are pretty drab. So this looks a little sportier. Um, it does have uh, several normal features beyond the compass and the, uh, the thermometer, which I'm not going to go into the thermometer at all. I very rarely need to know what the temperature is inside the sleeve of my jacket. So, um, of course, we've got uh, date and day of the week and time. We have a world time feature. I have it set to London for GMT time. We have a stopwatch, uh, which is pretty standard. We've got a pretty standard countdown timer. And we've got alarms. We've got... Let's see, we've got two, three, four, five. I think we have, let me see. One, two, three, four. Oh, okay, we have four alarms, it looks like. And back to time again. So it's a pretty cool watch. I'm gonna be wearing it a little bit. I don't know that I have a whole lot more to contribute to this video. So let's go, uh, I guess, back to the woods to wrap this up because uh, I obviously wasn't able to finish shooting this outdoors. The wind had just gotten too nasty. Uh, but let's head back outside and wrap this video up. So when this digital compass is used as it was intended, it can be quite a useful little uh, tool to have on your wrist when you're out in nature. As a matter of fact, I'm going to start wearing this watch uh, whenever I'm doing any outdoor adventuring uh, this coming season. And uh, so it'll probably be featured in a couple of upcoming videos. Uh, I'm interested to actually get out into the wilderness and really try this thing out and see if maybe I can do some proper land navigation using nothing but this. Um, maybe when I'm up in the north woods of Maine, I'll find a remote lake. And uh, of course, I'll have my GPS and my compass, my regular compass with me. But I'll try uh, navigating from one point on a map to another point on a map using nothing but this and see if that's possible. Uh, I hope some of you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing, like, share, tell your friends. All that good stuff goes a long way to help keep me here on the air. And when I post new content to the channel, I hope to see each of you here then. Later, guys.